So, approaching this topic um, is a somewhat difficult thing to do because what, what we're going to do, uh, it's difficult and not difficult in some sense. Um, it's not difficult in the sense that we have a revelation and God's provided that for us. Um, knowing who we are, it's a type of revelation that we can understand to a certain extent. I say to a certain extent because if you think about it, the truths that God reveals in the Bible, His understanding of those truths as He's communicated to us is far more vast than the understanding that we grasp from those truths when we study them. God has a far vast more knowledge, omniscience, right, of the things that are behind the truths that He's communicating than those things that we grasp when we study the very thing. But that doesn't mean that we can't understand any of it. Uh, the Trinity is such a topic that uh, to actually begin to approach the very essence and nature of God himself is because of our own capacities, and this isn't a bad thing, um, except for maybe where sin might enter in, but uh, so long as we are working under the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, we are a believer in the family, then we can approach it with revelation to try to understand to a finite level, to our, to our capacity as being human beings, an infinite God. And, uh, and he wants us to do that because, as we were talking before in some of the other uh, sessions, to, to enter into a relationship with someone, to have this fellowship, this love of someone, you know, Jesus asked, do you love me, is, is to have a relationship with something about that person. We don't have a relationship with someone that we don't understand. It's, it becomes a, an empty relationship. So the relationship is based on what that person knows about me and what I know about that person. And then we commune in that relationship and in that knowledge of that relationship. So I just wanted to preface that um, just so that we understand the nature of the topic. I approach it in great humility, in fear and trembling, as the Bible might use those terms. Uh, because certainly in talking a, on a topic such as this, um, to the best of my ability, I don't want to steer this topic wrong because I'm talking about the very God whom I love and who has done so much for me. And, you know, one might be able to mislead someone in maybe some uh, moral precepts or what to do in a certain situation in life. I certainly don't want to mislead anyone in the very nature of God himself. So I approach this with uh, a certain amount of humility. The, the current orthodox, and we use orthodoxy just to mean the accepted teaching that is held, uh, so, so, to, so to speak, the test of time and history of, uh, of the church, um, where believers who are responsible for disseminating the truth, who have studied the truth, uh, the place where most agree, I'm not going to say all, I can't, you know, I'm not going to make that kind of statement. Um, agree that God's entire individual nature is possessed equally, fully, and simultaneously by each person of the Trinity. So the Trinity, triuneness of God, is that God is one in essence and nature, but he's three in, in person. I don't know if you've ever heard that definition before. It's a very simplistic way to begin to approach it. So he's three in persons, he's one in essence, and those three persons possess that essence that, that we refer to, we refer to as God, equally, fully, and simultaneously. Now, this, when we're approaching this, the, the, uh, uh, this topic of the Trinity, we're going to look at a lot of scriptures. I want you to keep in mind that, because uh, I want you to use this kind of as, uh, as I'm going along, I want you to kind of start to assess. I'm going to present two different views on this issue. I'm going to tell you where I come out on this issue. Um, I, right now I come out somewhat on the minority, but I may not come out on the minority of this crowd, but I come out on the minority position as to, you know, as to where this position is held. Um, what I want you to kind of keep in mind is that because God is eternal, the nature of the Trinity has existed as such in eternity prior to creation. And so when we examine certain aspects of the persons of the Trinity, um, though they might help us in defining the persons in this relationship of the persons in the Trinity, we don't want to hold that definition just as it relates to creation, 
because then uh, that might be different in some sense as to how they relate. Now, maybe not, and that's really the controversy, but maybe not, but it may, it, it, it doesn't tell us the complete view of the Trinity unless what we see as far as how Trinity relates to creation holds an eternity. If that relationship has changed somewhat between eternity and, 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 uh, and time and history, um, then we're not seeing God in his essence as he exists prior to how he starts dealing in history. Um, if, if how he exists in history is the same as how he engages in, uh, how he existed in eternity is the same as how he relates in history, well then, uh, uh, there's not much of a change that goes on and, and we can grasp even more from that. But I want you to think about that. The basis that we should start from this is from what we can gather, how he existed in eternity. Um, because that's how he is in relationship as persons in the Trinity. Now, according to this definition, I think this is a, a, a fairly accurate de definition and a great place to work with. It seems then, if the uh, if if each person is the same in nature, okay, that they're identical in nature, each person possesses the same attributes. We use the term attributes. We say qualities. The things that we know about the about God as He is revealed. If each person possesses those things, then they are identical in those things, and it's in those things that we can't determine the difference between them. We can't find the distinction. So what makes one person in the Trinity distinct from another if each person is identical in their nature? Now, this is a question that um, I've been chewing on for quite some time. And uh, <laughs> when I decided to try to tackle this as a, a topic for the conference, I realized this is way too big for an hour and a half an hour of questions. Uh, so I wanted to narrow down an aspect of this topic. But if you can imagine, uh, Christian journals, Christian theological books, notes off the internet, covered over a table that I could not see over as far as reference works for me even trying to begin to get a handle on this. I just realized uh, this, is too, this is way too big. One of the areas that has been argued over, and this is where I want to focus now on, on, on answering this question, is whether the authority and submission relationship in the Trinity, okay, is something that was assumed by the persons in the Trinity in history, so that it's a temporal relationship, or whether this authority-submission relationship is something that has existed in eternity and also is reflected in God's dealing, in dealings in history. Um, so hopefully you understand kind of the distinction here. God existed in one, in one sense, and... Uh, See where I am on the here. So here's the two opposing views. He existed. God existed. The, 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 the nature of the authority structure in the Trinity is either eternal, so there's an eternal subordination and authority structure, or it's temporal. Um, another way of saying it is that in the in the eternal subordination view, is it's called, it's called um, yeah, basically the subordinate view um, or the authoritarian view, something like that. Uh, the one for the temporal one would be an egalitarian view, which is that in eternity, the Trinity has is, is equal in authority. Okay, that there's there is no real authority submission structure uh, per se in, in that relationship in the Trinity. But it's when history, when God decides to begin acting in history, then certain persons take on a subordinate role while one of the other persons takes on an authoritative role in order to uh, basically accomplish the plan of redemption, fulfill the plan of redemption. Now what I want to go through first of all, to just kind of lay some common ground, is on what do both sides agree? Because if we can kind of lay that ground, then we know that they don't have to fight over this part. And this kind of goes back to my definition. So first of all, the three persons possess God's nature equally, and this avoids Arianism. Now, Arianism is the view that certain persons, like the Son, um, is a lesser God than the other persons. Okay? That he lacks certain qualities that the other um, Jehovah's Witnesses are known for basically being, uh, uh, following kind of a view of Arianism. Because Jesus is a lesser God or a different God 
than uh, than the supreme God that they would say who is you know who's the Father. So both sides agree uh, that as far as possessing God's nature, they possess it equally. The secondly is fully and indivisibly, and this avoids tritheism that there are three gods, not one God in three persons. Okay. Uh, Tritheism would be kind of like uh, you have a pie and you draw three slices out of it and one of them is the Father and the other is the Son and the other is the Holy Spirit. You notice in that sense now each person is only possessing one third of God's nature rather than the entirety of God's nature. Um, that would be a divisibility or a way of dividing God's nature up. But to be fully and indivisible, for each person to fully and indivisibly possess God's nature is to avoid that. The third way, which we mentioned in the definition, is simultaneously. This avoids the problem of what's called modalism. Modalism is where God acts in, in, at one time as the person of the Father, as just a role. And then later on, He becomes the Son, and He performs the duties of the Son. And then later on, He changes into a third person and becomes the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But never is he all three persons simultaneously. He takes on a mode. The Father is one mode. The Son becomes a second mode. The Holy Spirit becomes a third mode. And he never occupies one of those modes um, with any of the others, just one at a time. So this is what basically uh, the, both sides agree. We can go over some scriptures if you're interested for uh, dealing with some of that. As far as equally, uh, we have John 1.1. 1, 1. And if you don't want to turn there, that's fine. You have a reference for that. The Word was God. So we have the Word, which we know is the second member. Is also, he's, he is fully God. We have that in Colossians 2.9 as well. That um, all the fullness of deity exists in bodily form, if I'm quoting that close to the New American Standard Translation. Um, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. That deals with uh, the tri tritheism problem and those kind of things. Um, there's other passages as well. We have, like, for example, in Matthew 28, 19. This avoids the modalism problem. This is a passage that we use to go to uh, show that God is not in modes. And we were, I think we were talking about this passage earlier. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All three. There's also the passage in Matthew. If that one's not convincing enough, you can think, well... We're just using these names, but you know, just because they're all there doesn't mean you can be them somewhat separately. You can go to Matthew chapter 3, at the baptism of Jesus, and all three are present. Jesus is present, the Son is present, being baptized. Okay? The Holy Spirit descends while Jesus is there, okay, as you know, in the form of a dove, where we have this picture of a dove. And the Father says, Behold, this is this is my son in whom I am well pleased. All three are present simultaneously. I want to draw a sketch real quick, which is a common sketch that's found. You may be familiar with it, I'm not sure. That kind of illustrates this nature of the Trinity. So we have God, when we refer to God and His nature. Okay. We have the Father. We have the Son. And we have the Holy Spirit. And it's kind of a neat little way to picture it. And summarize it. So the Holy Spirit is God. The Son is God. These are the words is and next to these little lines. But the Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Father, not the Son, and vice versa. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. So this is kind of what we're trying to communicate when we talk about the Trinity. And this is what both sides pretty much agree upon. They also agree that for the purpose of the redemptive act, there is a subordinate relationship. So if you imagine, we're, both sides are agreeing that during time, there's a subordinate relationship. The question now becomes, does that subordinate relationship exist in eternity, or is it only for the purpose of redemption? So I want to start with the eternal subordination view, or the subordination view. And this is what they pretty much hold, that there's this eternal hierarchy. 
The Father is the eternally supreme person or member of the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit is subordinate to the Father, eternally subordinate to the Father. As well, uh, the Son and the, and the Holy Spirit are both eternally subordinate to the Father. They use passages such as Romans 8.29, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. Now, foreknowledge is something that exists with the Father in eternity. I'll use the term eternity past. That would probably but when I use the term past, I, what I mean by eternity past is the time prior to creation. So the time in which it's just God existing alone. That's what I mean by eternity past, and I'll try to make reference to that term. So he's... He, the Father, is foreknowing those he also predestined, and those he is conforming to the image of his Son, and this, because foreknowledge exists in eternity past, well, therefore, then, the Son exists in eternity past. And the Father here is the one that's doing not only the foreknowing, but the predestining. Predestining. So you see, the Father is doing this kind of initiatory act. He is kind of the authority behind what's going on. He's the one that's initiating and carrying through this particular act, and uh, the Son is the recipient of this act in the sense that we are be being conformed to the Son. Uh, we also find this in Ephesians 1, chapter 4, something very similar, where uh, Paul writes in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. And by the way, if I read quickly one passage, one verse, it's not because I don't find any value in it, I'm just trying to get to the point. I read through a verse and I feel like, wow, I'm just kind of reading through the Word of God like it's nothing. I don't mean intend that. I understand I'm under a time constraint. So, But just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. So you notice again, the Father is choosing believers in Christ before creation. So you notice now the Father again is initiating. He's, he is acting in authority as far as this particular aspect. And, and He's doing this. So you see there's this kind of uh, uh, action and the receiving of the action between the Father and the Son. There's another, uh, there's another little way that this uh, used to be described, or it sometimes is still described, amongst the relationships of the Trinity. And it would be that the Father is the unsent sender. Okay, so he, he, doesn't, he, he isn't sent anywhere, but he's the unsent sender. The Son is the sent sender. So he's, he is sent, but he's also sends. And we might be familiar with the passage. I'll get there in a minute. And the Holy Spirit is the sent non-sender. That's the best way I can kind of describe it. The Holy Spirit is sent because um, there's a time when the Father, when Jesus says, the Father and I will send you the helper. So you notice that each one takes on a different aspect of this notion of sent. One is not sent, but does the sending. One is the recipient of sending, but also participates in the sending. And then the last person... And last, by no means, I'm making any less glory for him. But uh, last in my in my order of mentioning is the Holy Spirit. He's not mentioned in sending anyone, but he is being sent. Now, now in this view, and this is going to be a little bit difficult for me to try to go through, so please just be patient and think about it for a little bit. But the Father is the is the grounding, is the basis for the persons within the Trinity. Um, the, the Son is the one that is sent of the Father. Okay? And as well, the Son send, uh, the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit. So, the nature of the Trinity, the, how there are three persons in one, in one nature, in one being, is that, and this isn't a temporal thing, so you, this is kind of hard to kind of wrap your mind around a little bit, um, it's not like at a point in time the Son became where He wasn't existing before, but the Son in some sense proceeds from the Father, and then the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and, but this is an, 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 eternal, an eternal concept, and this is how the three persons are manifested in one God. This is in some way how they try to resolve and answer this question about how it is that you have three persons, but those three persons are only one God, and yet they are distinct, but they're not three gods. See, so this is the way that they try to explain some of that kind of stuff. 
Um, this is why we have, this is what they mean when you see terms such as that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. That there is this eternal begetting. This, this eternal... Any term that I use is going to have a temporal sense and you have to in your minds try to remove like this happened at a point in time. But this is eternal producing of the Son and then an eternal producing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's not a temporal thing. Uh, so wherever Jesus is called the only begotten Son, they refer to this passage. <clears throat> Furthermore, the titles Father and Son, okay, by the very meanings of, of the terms, uh, particularly since they communicate a particular human relationship, communicate that authority submissive structure. Okay, the Son, even in family terms, the Son is not the authority over the Father, right? It's the Father who has authority over the Son, and the Son obeys the Father. So by the mere fact of being called Son, it's automatically, it's an assumption of submission. Whereas the Father, by just being called Father, is the assumption of authority in the relationship. So part of this subordinate relationship, like I said, is the Son is eternally begotten from the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeds, eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son, and the title is Father and Son. Okay, are an authority submission type of relationship. Now, because now now that so that's that's it. And then I don't want to say that's it, but one of their other points is that, like for example, where I think we were already there in Matthew twenty eight nineteen, is that, and we refer to this in our language all the time when we're talking about the persons of the Trinity. Okay, or when the Bible mentions the names of the Trinity in which we should baptize believers. How do we say it? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In that order. Because the Father is the primary person, the primary authority in the Trinity relationship. The Son follows. And then because the Son is only sent to the Father. And then because the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is, and like I said, I don't mean these in any derogatory senses or anything like that, but the Holy Spirit is somewhat at the bottom of the authority structure in the Trinity. That the Trinity has a natural authority submissive relationship. And that's how it's structured. Okay? There is an argument that they pretty much present. And you know, and anybody that's been around some of my teachings, you know I like what's called syllogisms. And syllogisms have a very logical, deductive way in which the argument flows. So if you accept the two premises, you have to accept the conclusion. So this is the argument. The person's making ultimate decisions and initiating actions, the person or persons, possess or possesses the supreme authority. The Father is the one that makes ultimate decisions and initiates the actions in the Trinity. Therefore, the, the Father possesses supreme authority. This argument naturally follows. If you see the first premise is true, if you see the second premise is true, you can conclu conclude nothing but that conclusion, that the Father possesses supreme authority. This is the eternal subordinationist view. Okay? And it's this order that makes that distinction for us. It is this authority submissive relationship that we are now able to see how is it that the Son is different than the Father and the Holy Spirit is different than both of those when they possess identical natures and there can be no distinction made there. If it's not by nature, it's by relationship, or what they do. Maybe that's another way of saying it. But of course, in eternity, what they're doing is relationship. Right? Because there's no creation in which, in which they're interacting with. So every action within the Trinity is directed towards the other persons of the Trinity and directed towards self, in a sense. Okay? Um, we can see... We can see how the Father initiates some of this stuff. Uh, for example, John 6, 38. Jesus says, For I have come, come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So you see, there is this submissive authority thing that God's initiating. Who had the will? The Father. He initiates it. Who's following the will? The Son. Okay. John 8, 42. I have not come on my own initiative, but I've come to do the Father's will. I've come to do, uh, but he who sent me, excuse me, I'm kind of mixing up some verses here. Better just to stick to the word of God, right? 
<laughs> I'm on the Trinity, I better be careful. <laughs> For I'm not even come on my own initiative, but he who sent me. Okay? This, this position argues that if this structure, if this relationship did not exist in the Trinity, we can make no distinction amongst the persons of the Trinity. And if we can't make any distinctions amongst them, then there really is no trinity at all. If I held up an object, let's say like this pointer, and I said, this pointer is the Father, and I said, this pointer is the Son, and by the way, it's the same pointer. That's not because I've run out of pointers. And then I said, this pointer is the Holy Spirit. I've just referred to the same pointer every single time. There is no distinction between them. See that? Because this has not changed in quality at all from here to here to here. I've moved it spatially, but you know, as, as my friend Jerry always likes to say, analogies break down. <laughs> but I think you understand the picture. You see, there's, so, there, so the difference has to be in some sense, and if there's no difference at all, there's no trinity. It's just one God. So, so, so this, is, this is one of the problems, of course, that was dealt with in the early church. And the first thing was whether Jesus was fully God or not, and that's why they kind of dealt with the experience of that thing. But then how, how is this if, 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 the, if, if the Son is God, and they use this term Lord to distinguish between the Father. If the Son is God and the Father is God, how does this work? How, I mean, what's the difference? Um, I mentioned uh, the term only begotten. Uh, and this only begotten is in reference to his person. Not his nature, but his person. And let me just say that again so that I can try to make it clear. Because the, uh, these are somewhat difficult topics. And believe me, I was, you know, uh, I, I thought it was going to look like Greg by the time I was done with this topic. Because I was pulling on my hair, <laughs> trying, to get, <laughs> trying to get a wrap around this thing. Uh, <laughs> only begotten is not the nature because God has always existed. And this nature is unchanging, right? We know that God is an unchanging being. So it is the personhood of the second member of the Trinity that is in reference to being begotten from eternity, not his nature. I'm just going to let that sink in a little bit and move on a little bit, but I want you to try to understand that when we're talking about distinctions in the Trinity, we're talking about personhood, not nature. Now, I'm not going to go through all the passages. There's ten of them. I've already, uh, I've already, I got a ton of passages listed here. But um, there's a ton of them. If you did a word search and you just look at all the references that Jesus talks about being sent, this position would say, "Here it is." You see, the Son is sent. The Father does the sending. There's the establishing of the relationship. Okay. Um, the Son wouldn't send the Father. Matter of fact, he couldn't because of the person that he is in the Trinity. We would never see the Son sending the Father. So, it's only going to go one way, and if it's only going to go one way, then this must be, for lack of a better term, a quality or an attribute of the Son, and not the Father. Okay. Um, just to draw another little illustration real quick, this is real simple, but uh, Just the sending issue, and the, when I said unsent sender and sent sender, the Father sends the Son, okay? And it's the Father and the Son that sends the Holy Spirit. So the arrows direct how the sending, how the sending goes. So you have the Father sending the Son, and then the Son of the Father who sends the Holy Spirit. And this is kind of a picturesque way of uh, illustrating the authority-submissive relationship. That's the end of my sketches, so you got, you know, that's it. <laughs> you, have the rest of, you have the rest of the lecture to draw little circles if you need to. You can ask me questions about it later, but I'm not going to, uh, you know, do any more of that kind of stuff. Uh, the third, the third, or not the third, but another aspect of this is that um, the sun, upon ascension, is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. So... God is on the throne, the Father is on the throne, and after his ascension, the Son continues to sit on the right hand. The Father being on his throne is in the position of ultimate authority. 
Next to him, in a submissive but also carrying of authority, is the Son. And there are passages for that. If you're not familiar, uh, we can turn to Acts 2.32. So you guys think I'm not making this stuff up? <laughs> this uh, Peter's talking says this God, this Jesus got raised up again, to which we are witnesses. Therefore, having exalted Him, and having therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth this which you see both, both seen here. So the Son is sitting at the throne. He's ascended to the throne. There's other passages which you can look for. Now, the weightiest passage that they use, and this is a very difficult passage, I will admit to you that I have not fully, fully understand this passage, and like I said, I think uh, concerning the scriptures, God, of course, has a full understanding of what is communicated to us. We can have an understanding of it, but obviously we would never have the understanding of the scriptures that God has, Okay. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting around verse 23 or 20. 23 starts the sentence. Um, I'm sure you've seen this scripture before. It is, uh, it is definitely one of the most interesting passages concerning this issue. I'll start at 23. This is regarding the resurrection, by the way. So Paul writes, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, meaning he's the first to be resurrected. After that, those who are Christ that is coming. So nobody gets a resurrection body until Christ does first, because he's the premier. Then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. That abolishing of all that rule and authority and power are human institutions. Okay. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. And this is kind of the key verse here. And when all things are subjected to the Son, then the Son himself, it doesn't say the Son, but I, I'm interpreting here what it says subjected to him. Then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, that God may be all in all. So the culmination of history, as, in a court, you know, as far as what Paul is talking about in this passage, is that everything returns to where the Father has not that the Father ever, ever lost authority, but how we th see things functioning in history, everything returns to where the Father is supremely authoritative over everything that exists, including the Son, because then the Son subjects himself to the Father. Okay, that God may be all in all. So there's this kind of unifying culmination of these things that are happening. This is one of their weightiest passages that they refer to. Okay? That in some confusing summary, is the view that there is an authority-submissive relationship that exists eternally in the Trinity. And, this is, and these are the reasons why. The next view is called the temporal subordination. By temporal meaning, it hasn't lasted for all eternity. Or it could also be what I refer to called the egalitarian authority. Egalitarian means equal. Okay, so that the authority amongst the persons of the Trinity is equal. And except for, uh, uh, but, but the Son and the Holy Spirit take on a subordinate role to the Father for the purposes that they have for creation and history. And uh, pretty much as we understand this, this volume, these volumes of 66 books, and overall you could, you could, you could communicate that under the term of the redemptive plan. So for the plan of redemption, and I, and I say the redemptive plan because what I, don't want, what I don't want you to do is think that that plan completely ceases at the culmination of the work on the cross. It is certainly the, the primary focus of the redemptive plan, and it is a necessary part of the redemptive plan. But the redemptive plan continues on as uh, more human beings are brought into the redemptive plan. Um, so the redemptive plan, we could say, is, for, is pretty much what we know of history to its culmination. And it's during that time of from creation and all of its history that the Son and the, and the Holy Spirit take on a subordinate role to the Father 
But prior to that, the authority structure is equal. There's no internal authority submission relationship. Okay? Now, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 real quick. Just to kind of see where they begin to form this view and why we say it's based in redemption. And the writer of Hebrew writes, And he, meaning Jesus, he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. This is another great reference, this is another great reference, by the way, if you want to demonstrate that Christ has God's nature fully, exactly, you know, identically. And an of an end he upholds all things by the by the word of his power. When he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of high. So what was the function of the son? Well, one of them, at least, in this passage that we have, is he came to make purification of sins, and when he had done that, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty. So he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. By the way, both sides recognize that, otherwise they would be contradicting scripture. <laughs> right? Right. Uh, let me go to my next slide. So the word becoming flesh, and this is kind of what I said before, marks the temporal or the point of assumption of humility and subordination to the Father. So at the point, now this doesn't mean that this, this authority, submission, relationship was not in view in the Trinity, because the Trinity is omniscient. All three persons of God are omniscient. God has this essence, this attribute of omniscience. So it's not like nobody knew this was going to happen sometime in the future, right? God knows anything. He's never informed of anything. God's knowledge is never added to. Okay? So, though we have Old Testament passages that speak of this coming, okay, does not necessarily mean that in the time of eternity, and, and in God's mind, that the Son was in a subordinate relationship to the Father. It just means that they are seeing, because of having omniscience, they are seeing that at some point in time, the Son of the Holy Spirit will take a subordinate role to the Father in regards to the plan of redemption. Does that make sense? Okay. So, one of the strongest passages I think this position has is in Philippians chapter 2. Remember Philippians? I got it. Yeah. Next, next to Jonah. <laughs> 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 I'll start at uh, verse five. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although existed in the form of God, okay. Understand this form is not a physical form, right? He exists. Whatever form, for lack of a better term, we won't go into that whole issue right now, but whatever form God exists in, um, Jesus Christ is said to exist in that form. Did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, I'm not going to say that equality only references an authority equality, but this seems to be an equality with the very nature of God himself. So everything concerning God, Jesus Christ has this prior to his incarnation. He is completely equal with God. That's why we say Jesus Christ is God. He okay. did not consider that equality a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. Now, taking the form of a bondservant is something that he didn't have prior, apparently. So if he's taking the form of a bondservant, then he's becoming subordinate prior to not being so. He took on the form of a bondservant, you see. So this, this egalitarian view is, is, is holding, this is one of the passages they go to, is holding that the three members of the Trinity have equal authority in eternity, past. I kind of qualified that term, meaning prior to any acts of creation and everything else in history. Have equal authority amongst equality and everything else concerning God. And then, at the mark or at the point of incarnation, Jesus Christ takes on this submissive role. 
Uh, let's look at Hebrews 5.8 as well. And this, and the writer of Hebrews says, although he, <coughs> Jesus, was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. What the writers of Hebrews are saying here is that obedience is something that the son learned. Now, if there is an eternal authority, submissive relationship in the Trinity, then the son never learned that. Because to learn that which mean, would mean didn't have it before, but now he has it now. That's what learning would be, right? So to learn something would mean not to have learned or known that before in some sense, but now he does. So this passage seems to indicate that learning obedience, and obedience is definitely what we mean in some sense by submission, unless we mean coercively or by force, and we don't think that the Son by force submitted to the Father, right? You know, do this or else by threat. That's not the Son. The Son always does those things which are pleasing to the Father. Um, so, uh, and for the joy set before Him, you see, you know, and not that anybody here believes that, but I just want to qualify and make sure. So He learned obedience, and He learned obedience from the things which He suffered. So this passage uh, indicates that this submissive role is something that the Son, or the second member of the Godhead, or the Word, whatever you want to call it, is something that he learned and he took on. He, uh, he assumed in, uh, in becoming incarnated, becoming the God-man. Okay. Now, what this side will also argue is that all the passages that the other side referred to as the Son being sent is all in reference to human history only. That every time Jesus says, why do those things? You know, I, it's not of my will, but I do the will of him who sent me. It's while he is Jesus. And remember in the beginning of the lecture, I stated that for us to really come to a more succinct understanding of possibly which side has the better case, which side is right, is to try to consider this outside of outside of history, because this relationship is one that would be existing in eternity past, not one within history. Okay? It could extend into history, but if it can be demonstrated that this relationship seems to have been developed in history, and it, it began and culminates in history, then it's not something of the nature of the relationship in eternity past. Okay? So, the next point that they want to argue, in, in somewhat in contradistinction or in, in contrary to the previous view, is these terms father and son are not implicitly authoritative in nature, but they are of likeness or sameness. Okay? We have the recognition of that in John chapter 5. And verse 18. Okay, verse 17, Jesus says, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not, not because he was breaking the Sabbath, or because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also calling his own Father, calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. See, they had even understood that by calling God Father, he wasn't saying, well, he's the authority and I'm submitting to him. And that's why I'm calling myself the Son and Him Father. Because, I mean, they would, you know, those guys would have agreed, well, that's what everybody should be doing, is submitting to God. They had a problem with Him calling Himself the Son and God His own Father because it meant that they shared equal nature. They were equal in all the essence of who God is, all the attributes that we consider of God, sovereignty being one of them. Furthermore, um, we can look at, and we won't go there, but we can look at, let's say, like Matthew chapter 1, Luke chapter 3, Genesis chapter 5, and in all those instances, 
source and relationship, okay, uh, sameness or likeness of, of nature is what's being communicated. You have the genealogies in, in Genesis chapter 5, okay. Uh, Matter of fact, you even have, if you, if you were to, I think, if you were to somewhat follow the implications of the genealogies of Jesus, so that you have, there's the father, and then he begat this person who became his son, and this guy begat this person who became his son, and the like, and you have Jesus at the bottom, it would actually seem that everybody above him would be in authority over Jesus. I mean, wouldn't that be some of the logical implication, that Jesus is at the bottom of the father-son chain of who people are? But no, this is, there are very important aspects to why Jesus is tracing his genealogy. Because um, he wouldn't be the Messiah if he didn't have that genealogy. But it's also showing this, this is how the Semitic ancient concept of father-son was understood. The, the, you know, we would say, oh, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? But the son is like the father, you know. Um, we have that uh, Adam's progeny were in the likeness of Adam, as something we were referring to last night or a couple nights ago, I'm already losing track of time. So this point stands in, in, in somewhat contrariness to the previous view, that father and son is an implicit authority, submissive role. Whereas the egalitarian view says, no, no, no. These terms father and son are really relating to how the son is the same as the father in nature. That the, that to claim to be the son is to claim to be God. Because he's claiming the same nature. There we go. So, their argument. Now here's the syllogism on their side. And what I want you to notice is the first premise is the same. They, they, they assume the same thing. The person who's making ultimate decisions and initiating, the person or persons, making ultimate decisions and initiating, initiating actions uh, possesses or possess the supreme authority. It's the second premise that changes for this group. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit jointly make decisions and initiate actions. Therefore, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit jointly possess the supreme authority. So this is kind of the, the summation of the argument for where these guys stand by. In the, in the first, in the first sides, premise two was that the Father is the only one that initiates action and, uh, and, and has uh, supreme authority, makes ultimate decisions, and initiates actions. That was, the first, that was the first view, the eternal view. This view is that all three members of the Trinity do so. Okay. Now, the basis of each person and I think I've kind of stated this in some other words before, the, the basis of each person, each of the three persons of the Trinity has, to, has his basis in the nature of God's being. Now this is important. What this is saying is that each person is God because he possesses fully, simultaneously, and equally, okay, the nature of God. That, in a sense, what makes each person God and, what, and where, how a person is established, how, how a person is a quality of God, outside of the fact that we are recognizing in Scripture and Revelation, is this based in the very nature of God. Okay? That's the egalitarian view. And I think, and I think it's, it's, it's the best view to hold. If, if, person, if the person of each person of the Trinity is based in another, Okay, such that the Holy Spirit is in some sense based because of the Son, and the Father and the Son because of the Father, but the Father begets the Son. So the Son kind of derives his personhood from the Father because he's eternally begotten of the Father. Rather than it being based in, excuse me, in the very nature of God himself, then we have a problem because the Father's personhood is based in something different than the Son and the Holy Spirit. And if that's the case, I think in some way, it makes the other two persons of the Trinity less divine than the Father. Because the basis for their subsistence, as a technical word that's used, 
for their personhood, for their being as a person. Their basis is in another person rather than the very nature of God. And I think the implications of the first view, okay, is that, uh, is that their personhood is based in the Father because he's the supreme one. And this view then, and this is one of the, one of the criticisms of the eternal subordination view, is it starts leaning towards Arianism. Because if you start leaning too far, all of a sudden, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are a lesser God. See, they're a lesser God than the Father. Um, they will continue, and you can probably already see what side I'm coming out on, right? I'm on the egalitarian side. <laughs> so I'm in the minority amongst most of the works that are out there on this topic. Okay. Um, so we'll see how the Q&A goes. Now, and this kind of this this slide just kind of amplifies what I just said. Now. Remember what I referred to Matthew 28 and how...